Thank you, Colin. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, my job is to introduce our two esteemed uh, guests this evening, but let me just sort of set the scene uh, a little bit. We live in a consumptogenic world. <coughs> Excess human consumption of Earth's resources has led to the degradation of the world's natural environmental systems, of course, including uh, the climate system. I'm very concerned about that because these systems are essential for human life, uh, which is fundamental for our health and our well-being. I'm interested in, in human health. So as the temperature of the planet rises, we're experiencing many more severe floods, droughts, storms and heat waves. These cause real harm to both our physical and our mental health and well-being. And it's very much upon us. In the next 15 years, there's going to be 38,000 additional deaths due to heat exposure among the elderly. 48 additional deaths due to diarrhea. 60,000, thousands I should say, not just 48, 48,000. 60,000 deaths due to malaria. And then 95,000 additional deaths due to childhood undernutrition. But all of that doesn't actually happen equally uh, around the world. We will all be affected, everywhere will be affected, but it is the poorest and the most disadvantaged regions and populations throughout the world that are affected most and that are generally affected earliest, including here in Australia. So what must be done to address all of that? Climate change adaptation and mitigation uh, requires action across a whole number of policy domains. Energy, of course, infrastructure, agriculture, labour, social policy are all required. And interestingly, these are all issues that really matter for human health and well-being. So let's not just think about climate change as a technical issue or as an economic issue. It's very much a people issue uh, and it relates to her, our health. But of course, the challenge, as we're going to hear, is how do you pursue all of these issues in a place where politics and differing interests come together, often in a very conflictual way. Understanding how to make action happen requires understanding the political economy of climate change. Shifting the political and the public desire for action means that we have to get very clever as to how we think about <coughs> climate change, how we frame the discourse about climate change, and of course governing climate change for the public good, whether it's health or social uh, outcomes, requires building coalitions of civil society, of enlightened businesses and concerned governments and politicians. Which brings me to our speakers this evening. Mark Butler has been the Labour member for Port Adelaide in the Federal Parliament since 2007. And tonight, of course, we're going to hear about his new book, Climate Wars. In July 2016, Mark was appointed Shadow Minister for Climate Change Energy and Energy. But Mark's also, he was the Minister for Ageing and was Australia's first Minister for Mental Health in the then uh, Gillard government. And he's received the Alzheimer's Disease International Award for Outstanding Global Contribution to Fighting Against Dementia. And he's also held ministries uh, of housing, homelessness, social inclusion, climate change, water and energy. So Mark understands fine well uh, the challenges, but also the opportunities for how to build coherent uh, public policy across a number of domains, many of which are highly contested. And I met Mark uh, earlier this year when the ALP held a national health summit. And when he told me about his book, I thought, well, here's a lovely opportunity for us to come together to break down this sort of often compartmentalised uh, attitude to thinking about some of our big societal challenges, such as health and environmental issues, so that we can actually think about the big consumptogenic drivers of climate change and health which are so, so similar. It's a win-win, uh, but we've actually got to get our finger out and do something about it, so no pressure, Mark. Um, the conversation is going to be facilitated with another, by another Mark, uh, Professor Mark Howden, who's the director of the ANU's Climate Change Institute, sits across the whole of the university. That's how important we consider this issue to be. It's a university-wide issue. 
Mark is also the Vice Chair of the IPCC and a member of the Australian National Climate Science Advisory Committee. And isn't it fantastic that we've still actually got such a committee uh, within the country? So please join me in welcoming Mark Butler uh, and Mark Howden. Over to you, Mark. Thanks very much for that introduction, Sharon, and, and welcome, Mark. And, and it's particularly notable, I think, within your book that uh, ANU did actually feature uh, quite strongly. And so, so I think this is a great venue for mm. you to be uh, I'm launching this book and having these conversations. Um, I have to congratulate you on the book. I um, finished reading it again um, this afternoon, and, uh, and I, I thought it was uh, a really broad um, perspective on the issue, uh, comprehensive integrative um, and particularly rich in detail, in particularly the historical detail of, of where we've come from. Uh, and, and I think it's a, it's a really great exposition in that sense. And, uh, and, I, and I think um, we, we actually need that, as, as Sharon just said, we actually need to draw the dots between these issues and so that we, we can actually have a stronger rationale for progressing rather than isolating this as an issue. And so I think you're, you've done a, a really good job there. So I, I guess the, the, one of the first questions I've got is, is um, with this book, what, what impact do you really want to have with it? Where do you think this is going to, what, is, what sort of splash is it going to make and what, where the ripples go? Yeah, well, in, in part, it was an exercise in therapy um, <laughs> over the summer just to vent, frankly, about, about how we've got to where we've, where we've arrived. Um, and I did it over the summer and it got much worse, frankly, in March in South Australia. I talk about some anecdotes. Uh, around um, around South Australia's sort of the attack on South Australia's energy transition, and um, particularly a, a concert that Adele did in Adelaide. It was the only concert she did in the round, so she did it in the centre of Adelaide Oval. She had a special stage made uh, from this fabulous firm operating out of Bendigo that, that revolved, well, not that fast, obviously, because she would have been flung <laughs> off the stage, <laughs> the centrifugal force, but revolved slowly uh, in front of the 70,000 fans. And I bought two tickets, taken them home to my daughter and said, yay, we're going to Adele. And she said, yay, you're half right. Uh, took the tickets, took a friend. Um, <laughs> but partway through the concert, uh, a whole, whole bunch of the sound just went down. And Adele said, oh, there's been a power blackout. And Jay said, um, Jay Weatherall, the Premier, said at an event we were doing the other night that he was with the energy minister in the corporate box, Tom Kutzentonis, who just passed out and had to be <laughs> sort of revived with smelling salts. Um, and the, and, but within, within, what had happened is that the revolving stage had grabbed a cord and pulled it out of the socket. Right? Not something you think you could really connect to the deployment of renewable energy in South Australia, but that <laughs> didn't stop this sort of blitzkrieg assault by the social media team and News Limited that literally were on Twitter within five or ten minutes uh, uh, criticising South Australia's energy policy. Chris Kenny got onto Sky News and um, said there's been another power blackout in South Australia because of renewable energy. Even the advertiser the next morning had a front page power crisis, uh, all because this plug got pulled out of the socket and some flustered roadie put it back in and then about two or three minutes and the concert went straight on. And I just, I, 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 how did we get to this position? How did we get to this position after the, the hope and the sense, sort of consensus in the community that they wanted their government 10 years ago to take strong climate action. Like the, the level of support for climate action 10 years ago was as high as it's ever been in Australia. And I think Kevin gave voice to that uh, in his usual way, so not particularly understated way, about this being the, the major social, economic and moral challenge of our times, because it is. And yet we've arrived at that position where you could get that sort of peak stupid contribution to what had happened at the Adele concert. And I think we need to start to call it out because we have been dragged, Australia, into this parallel universe. Uh, all through those 10 years, you've just seen the scientific consensus get stronger. The impacts of climate change start to unfold before our eyes. And particularly over the last three or four years, the rest of the world start to shift. The private sector started to shift. Governments have started to shift. Even governments that are, that are subject to very, very difficult circumstances, like the UK, and I'll talk about the UK a bit in my book, but not here in Australia. We are just paralysed through this debate that is led by 
this, this very loud minority in the parliament, in the media, on talkback radio in Sydney. And if we, if we don't take them on and actually start to call them out and talk um, real facts and really give some perspective to the community about what's happening around the world and the depth, the gravity of the challenge that we face and our responsibility to our children and our grandchildren, we're not going to move forward. We're just not going to move forward. That's really why I did it. Um, unashamedly, uh, I'm a Labor Party person, uh, and so I burnished Labor's credentials in undertaking and leading these sorts of major economic reforms, because this is what, this is what we're, we're confronting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is uh, something that the Labor Party should be leading, uh, calling on some of the traditions of, of past decades where the Labor Party has seen this as part of their core social democratic mission, not just to break down those structural inequalities in society, which was really the reason we were formed 130 years ago, but also to manage these inevitable disruptions and transitions that come along every few decades, like Bob Hawke and Paul Keating did in the 1980s. So it is also a bit of, uh, you know, unashamedly a handbook for Labor Party members, Labor supporters, uh, and um, a burnishing, I hope, of Labor's credentials in this area, while also, frankly, being honest about the mistakes that we've made mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, and we did make some substantial ones. We've got to learn from them, be honest about them, uh, and, and move forward. Yeah. No, that's really important in terms of trust repair, you mm. know, acknowledging those things. I, I guess, um, for, for me, you, you raised initially the, that issue about communication, how we've got a real um, a problem here, I think, in Australia. And, and for me, it's illustrated by, um, if you look at the stats, um, uh, you know, three quarters of Australians actually want more action on climate change, two thirds actually want a carbon price. Um, so so that, that consensus, you know, broadly across the society is really strong. And, um, and if you're sort of starting to think, um, well, there's about 7% of the population who are sort of climate deniers in the yeah. sense they say climate's not changing and humans aren't involved anyway. Um, so that's proportionally across the, the community, um, that's about 1.6 million people who'd express that view. Um, the, the science of climate change is that there's less than a one in 100,000 chance that what we're seeing is not due to human influence. Um, so if you, if you do a proportionate sort of sum, is there should be around about 270 climate deniers in the population, not 1.6 million. And so, um, so we have, we've got an extraordinarily um, disproportionate sort of um, uh, emphasis in the communication which, which focuses on, uh, I, I guess, a, a position which isn't supported by the science. Um, it strikes me that this book by itself is not enough. And so, so how does this fit into a broader strategy to break that communication nexus? It is, it is, it is tough to, to break the, the locked-in consensus view, particularly the Murdoch media and a number of the key talkback uh, hosts, that this is all rubbish. It's a leftist conspiracy to deindustrialise the West in a way that we weren't able to do during the Cold War. I mean, this is, this is very much baked in to a lot of those mainstream media. Interestingly, that, as you'd know, that 7% who respond to the CSIRO Community Attitude Survey and say they don't think climate change is real, are then asked a question, um, what share of the population do you think share your view? And they say 50%. Mm -hmm. They think half of the population is of the same view that they have. And frankly, reading a lot of our newspapers or listening to Alan Jones, uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it is that, it has, it is that broad. Uh, I was asked last night when I was doing an event in Victoria, because um, I was talking about the extraordinary progress the United Kingdom is making, and someone very wisely said, well, the Murdoch media is just as dominant in the UK as it is here. Why, why, what, where's the difference? Why does the parliament in the UK have such a consensus position? And the simple fact of the matter is that Murdoch media has different fish to fry in, in the UK. They, they sort of focus on division around other issues, integration with the EU, immigration, Islam, those sorts of things, and they've sort of left climate change alone. So we do need to face up to the fact we've got a, quite a unique monumental challenge about our mainstream media. And uh, the only way around that, frankly, is, is a bit of old-fashioned sort of discussion and grassroots organising combined with the extraordinary opportunities that come through social media, the way to work around uh, those traditional mainstream media outlets. And, and also to paint a story that gives people hope. You know, I, th I think you know, all of us have been thinking very carefully about how you communicate climate change, given just the scale 
uh, of, of the issue. Um, I've watched, I watched Obama a lot in his, in his second term where he really grabbed climate change as a legacy issue for him. Uh, and one of the interesting things, Sharon, that you would have noted is that, that Obama hardly ever talked about climate policy without a health frame or at least a jobs frame, one or the other. He very rarely talked about it in the abstract. He talked about it in, in a way that people understood either the threat and the challenge or in a jobs frame, the opportunities that come with the shift to a low carbon economy. I don't know that we've done that well enough. I don't think we did that well enough when we were in government. There was a bit too much of a focus on market mechanisms and you know, carbon pricing and those sorts of means rather than the ends, yep. which are much more human rather than economic and market oriented. So I don't know, I don't pretend that I've sort of nailed this. Mm. And, and part of going around the country and talking to people in a way that might sound a bit like therapy about what's happened over the last 10 years is because I'm really thirsty for people who are committed in Australia to seeing their parliament take the sort of action that you're seeing at state level, you're seeing around the rest of the world. I'm thirsty for their ideas about what convinces people, yep. what, what brings people um, with us on this journey. Mm, that's a really good point. And I guess one of the things that struck me when I was reading the book was You'd, you'd sort of broadened the, the debate about um, electricity system reform from reliability and affordability, um, which has essentially dominated the airwaves for, for some time so far. And you started to bring in sort of issues about um, uh, energy efficiency, um, obviously the climate change, greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, regional development, um, environmental benefits, you know, Great Barrier Reef, air pollution, etc. Um, employment benefits, which are pretty obvious, the health benefits that Sharon was mentioning. The, the thing I, I guess I, I was looking for there was really pulling all of that together into like um, an industry policy mm. and how this, you know, like a whole of Australian industry policy, not just focusing on this. And, and likewise, um, innovation policy. Mm. And so making this a centrepiece for, for innovation, we are going into a massive transition globally. There's the opportunities there that we really need to be grabbing hold of. Um, do you, were you thinking about that or is that the next phase of the next book sort of thing? Yeah. It's my next book. Um, uh, we, are, we are thinking about that and, and part of our challenge in, in, well, part of our challenge in doing this is just the scale of it, the resources you have in opposition and, you know, the time taken to do this right. Part is also, you know, as simple as data collection. So one of the things that strikes me about the UK is that the UK can, can say that, um, you know, they're do, do, getting these extraordinary cuts in their carbon footprint. One of the, one of the members of 350.org told, told me that their carbon um, output, carbon pollution footprint last year uh, was uh, lower than any year since Queen Victoria's reign. It's just extraordinary. The year before was the lowest since 1940s. I and mean, they're doing, doing extraordinary things. But still, they make three times as much steel as raw steel as Australia does. They still have 800,000 workers employed in the automotive industry, where we're about to shut our industry. They're maintaining an industrial base while, um, while undertaking various, very ambitious decarbonisation. And they've got the ability to collect data that allows them to paint a story about the low carbon economy. So they can say, for example, uh, this is old data from last year, but they could, they could say then that 30% of all jobs growth in the last five years in the UK were low, low carbon economy jobs. And we don't collect that data mm. through the ABS here. We can collect renewable energy jobs in its strictest sense of the term. But I think we need to start, what we're trying to do is starting to think about how we measure this stuff so that we can talk about it, uh, not just in an abstract way, but in quite a concrete way. Uh, and um, you know, talk, talk about these stories, these inspirational stories that are happening around the world, that it's not you know, decarbonisation does not mean wrecking your labour market. Um, there are enormous investment and job opportunities here if you manage it right. Yeah, yeah. I'd probably expand that to um, enormous opportunities offshore as well. Mm. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago where we were leaders um, in terms of solar PV and, and also we had a wind turbine industry and other things and, uh, and we, to some extent, sacrificed those uh, in the 90s when we, we killed the Energy Research and Development Corporation. That's and, right. Uh, and so, which also I thought was, a, I was looking for that in the book, which I didn't mm. see. 
Um, <clears throat> but because uh, I think that's a, a story of, uh, of a public policy failure where that was actually a, a clean, green, high-tech, high-paying high, um, future for Australia, which we, we fore, forego, forewent at that stage. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess uh, there's, there's the um, economic uh, offshore opportunities, but also that of um, regional development. So um, as part of our aid program, as part of um, bringing other countries up so they can leapfrog um, the trajectory we went through, the fossil fuel in intensive trajectory, and actually, um, you know, get into the um, clean green economy much quicker than we have. Um, again, you know, are you looking to sort of bed that into policy? We are. We're, we're still having a look at really what the government is doing with its with its sort of climate change overseas aid crossover and how some of the new mechanisms beyond the Kyoto Protocol roll out. There will be new design to the way in which. There's essentially a finance transfer from developed countries to developing countries, as well as a knowledge transfer. And I think um, that's incredibly exciting. And I think the post-2020 post framework under Paris is going to be, frankly, much more sophisticated than the Kyoto Protocol framework. We'll learn a lot from that. It will be a market that Australia is able to sell into, as well as buy, in terms of international carbon credits, which I think gives the Australian land sector enormous opportunities uh, in, in the future. But it's sort of pretty, um, pretty embryonic work at the moment. We're, mm. we're certainly spending a lot of time with those organisations that are involved in the development of the sustainable development mechanism at a, the global level. Yeah, and th that's a, um, a very active area yeah. of discussion and, and some of the things you raise in the, in the book are, are, are play well into that. I, I guess um, part of the Paris Agreement also is this um, idea of just transition and, uh, and you've painted out a picture of doing this at a regional level better than we have over the last few years. Um, but the sort of scale of transition that you're talking about is actually huge, and, um, and doing it piecemeal is, is probably not going to mm. cut it. You know? So I, I think you know, you're going to get a lot of people who are left behind. Um, in in an environment of you know, budget repair, um, how, do you, how do you start to think about juggling <coughs> those things? So this is, this is um, I, I deal with this in a chapter of the book, and, and it was a clause in the Paris Agreement that this transition to a clean energy economy or a low carbon future must be a just transition. Mm -hmm. um, it was one, unfortunately, that our government fought against um, its inclusion, but the NGO sector particularly fought very hard for it to be included. And we have to give it meaning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's part of the international commitment we've made, but it's just the proper thing to do as well. And we need to, I try to be um, honest about the fact that we're not very, we've not been good at structural adjustment mm. in Australia. And there are some exceptions. I talked about the, the 80s in the car, plan, the car plan, the steel plan, the waterfront reform authority, some of the other microeconomic reforms that, that Hawke and Keating oversaw then had some good examples of structural adjustment. But the scale of this, as you say, is quite unprecedented. Mm. And unlike a lot of those industries that were, were um, often located in big cities, this is significantly going to impact regional economies. Those, those communities that in the post-war period were largely built on coal-fired power and sometimes the energy intensive manufacturing that co-located, the Hunter, the Illawarra, the Latrobe Valley, the Iron Triangle in South Australia, and, and uh, finding economic reasons for those communities to continue to exist and to thrive is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. And, um, you know, there's not a great bucket of money in the budget to do that. Mm. Probably the most exciting model, I think, uh, that's, that's been floated over the last several years came from the Crawford School uh, here at ANU, uh, where, um, where Jotso um, developed this idea, essentially, of a reverse tender that would see the power industry effectively financing a structural <coughs> adjustment package for the electricity sector. Now, obviously, this is not just a transition that's going to impact the electricity sector, but I, what I would like to see is for us to think about new ways of doing structural adjustment in the electricity sector that can be used not just, frankly, for transition that flows from decarbonisation, but for a whole range of different industries in transition. I come from Adelaide, where right now, over the next couple of months, Holdens and a series of supply companies are shutting down, essentially, because of government policy. Thousands and thousands of workers are losing their jobs. And the transition plan there, or the structural adjustment plan there and in Victoria, is pretty pitiful. Um, so I'd like us to learn not just about transition through decarbonisation, but frankly, transition more broadly 
uh, in the economy because there's lots of other pressures, frankly, on the economic status quo. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think Newcastle is a good example of where that, that has, has actually worked um, yep. very well. Um, but you can only do that so many times. You, you, right. you can't keep on rolling it out. So you need to be um, looking for niches which are regionally specific. Um, so I think that's it's a really important part of the, the picture. But it also plays into that idea of having, uh, you know, a, essentially an industry policy which integrates um, these issues, mm. um, you know, very really thoroughly with regional development, etc. And um, and, and it's a challenge, as you know, but, uh, it's, uh, but I think it's something we should aspire to. It is. And I, I think also we should talk um, more positive, not more positively than you and I are, but more positively than is the orthodox um, approach to what, what the energy transition is going to mean for our industrial base. I mean, I talked about what the UK is doing. But Bloomberg New Energy Finance does some really interesting analysis of um, the comparison of levelised costs of solar power and of wind power between Australia uh, Europe, China, help me out, Hugh, uh, Australia, the US, China, India and the EU. Uh, and because we have such, such stronger solar resources, mm. so our solar farms operate at efficiency factors of about 45% compared to China's 25%, because our wind resource is so much stronger than all of those other jurisdictions, once the transition has flowed through and we're all operating under this sort of an energy system, the cost advantage, the comparative advantage that we got through lots of access to cheap coal in the 20th century returns to Australia in the 21st century. We've just got to manage the transition right and, and be careful about maintaining the industrial base that we have because, frankly, it's very hard to build once you've lost it. You know, it's going to be very hard to rebuild a car industry having, having lost it really through a couple of weeks of of impulsive policy decisions by Joe Hockey. Yeah, yeah. And, and decisions made when the dollar was a dollar five. Um, That's right. We all knew that the dollar was going to come back to yeah. sub eighty cents, and with a bit of investment, the car industry would be able to get through that. And at, and at the sort of currency exchange rate it's at now, Holden's and Toyota would be doing fine. They'd be exporting vehicles again to police forces in the US, to the Middle East, that'd be fine. They just needed that support through that sort of Dutch disease period where the currency was over a dollar. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's right. And so, so in the book you talk about um, how to deal with um, emissions intensive, strategically important industries. Mm -hmm. and, and I think probably with the, the current sort of global volatility, that's even becoming more um, important in, in the policy sense. Um, but it's a difficult thing to do, you know, trading off the um, specificity of that versus a, an overall approach to, say, emission reduction. And um, have you got any other thoughts to how you might approach this in, mm. in government, if, if and when? So, so this is a really tricky bit because mm. when, but in both iterations of our ETS, the Penny's CPRS and then Greg's clean energy package, we had to deal with what are called emissions intensive trade exposed industries. That was, that was tougher then when there were very few carbon price systems across the world. There are more now, uh, most notably perhaps China is, is introducing their national ETS, coincidentally with very, very similar design elements to ours because so many of our people were engaged in helping design the, the Chinese ETS. So same scope of industries, same threshold of about 25,000 tonnes, really interesting sort of similarities to our package. But we, but we wanted to make sure that there was some understanding or recognition of the competitiveness issues between, you know, for industries that effectively operate in global markets. And I think what we did was we essentially took a cookie cutter approach, mm -hmm. you know, rather than thinking um, of the fact that, well, you know, I can't imagine Australia not making steel, being a you know, substantial economy uh, in our position in the world, essentially an island nation, we should have a steel-making capacity. And we've got to find a way to reconcile that strategic imperative with our decarbonisation objectives. Uh, rather than treating every emissions-intensive trade-exposed industry the same and having this sort of decay factor in their level of support, which was essentially how the CPRS and Greg's package were designed, we should be a little bit more nuanced about this, I think. Now, quite, quite how you deal with those conflicting imperatives, particularly in industries like cement and steel that don't have 
a technology on the horizon that will deal with their inherent carbon intensity is no easy challenge. But I think that's the debate we should be having. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we talk about that in our policy that we took to the 2016 election we, and we talked about it there. Uh, ultimately, I think, certainly in the short to medium term, it's going to involve those, those industries having to deal with their carbon footprint through an offsets arrangement, which would, in a domestic um, paradigm, probably focus particularly on, on, on re reinvigorating the carbon farming market that allows offsets to be produced in our land sector, both in the southern half of the continent, but also excitingly, I think, in Aboriginal communities through savannah burning projects that were starting to get off the ground under our carbon price mechanism, but really had their market taken off them when Abbott abolished it all. Mm, yeah. and, and we already see um, a couple of mining companies already converting their operations to solar. Yeah. And so even for extraordinarily energy intensive um, operations, you know, we're getting to the, uh, the price point where, where in fact that that can occur. And so I think that's a really positive um, sign it, it opens the door for, for others to, to follow through. Well, completely makes sense for, for those operations that are off-grid. Yep. Um, so mining operations that are in remote Australia to set up solar and particularly with some batteries and then some diesel backup. Uh, but increasingly, I was doing business roundtables in Bendigo yesterday and all of, the, I mean, all of the companies there were talking about going solar. Um, they're really under pressure with their power bills. They're coming up to renegotiate their contracts and the power prices that they're getting quoted are more than twice what their last contract had. And at the same time, their gas prices have doubled or tripled. So they're really feeling the pressure. And, you know, they're not... The, interestingly, none of them were saying, we've got to build new coal-fired power stations. Yes. They were saying, we're going solar. Yep. We're going solar. It makes sense. And we see the storage revolution coming at us like a locomotive train and we're ready for it and we want to invest in it. Yeah. And uh, absolutely, and I was going to ask about the storage right now. Um, and so, so one of the things I've noticed is that there hasn't been much criticism or critique of Snowy Hydro too. Um, here at ANU, we've got some people who are um, very strong proponents yeah. of, of pumped Pump hydro, hydro yeah. and, uh, and its, its prospects in Australia. Um, uh, but it's a, um, you know, Snowy Hydro is, is a... Um, I guess a, um, a, a very specific example, um, but I haven't heard much from, from your side of politics on this. Well, um, we, we tried to be even-handed about it, and, but, but also take it for what it was, which was the announcement of a feasibility study that will run over the course of the rest of this year, and it's a huge project. Um, Malcolm sort of grabbed onto it as something that he really needed, I think, to appear nation building, appear to be doing something in energy while his party room was really pushing him just to announce new coal-fired power stations. So we saw the politics of it, but, but equally the rise in gas prices over the last 12 or 24 months have meant that, um, that, that Snowy 2.0 has become economically viable, according to the company. Um, it wasn't two years ago. Uh, so we want to look at the feasibility study. It's, it's you know, Malcolm sort of... I think gave a sense to people that building would start in January after the feasibility study was received in December. Well, you know, we're drilling really big holes through mountains in a national park. I think we might want to do an environmental impact statement before we do that. I mean, really, if this happens, it's not going to come on stream before 2025. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, no, it's no short, medium solution to some of our challenges in the way that, say, the South Australian battery is. But I think, you know, the, these sorts of things should be assessed. Um, I hope that the feasibility study tries to compare the idea of a very big pumped hydro, massive pumped hydro scheme to what we know is coming in battery storage, but also the really exciting work that the ANU, through Andrew, has been doing uh, about a much more dispersed or distributed pumped hydro network mm -hmm. uh, that, um, that they've been working on with ARENA. So, now, this is going to be great. The idea of lots more storage plays right into my ambitions of deploying renewable energy. I'm not sure that the coalition party room quite saw through that, but really this, this turbocharges the ability, particularly of Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia, to expand renewable energy. Whether it's snowy hydro or lots of distributed pumped hydro, you know, build an interconnector between South Australia and New South Wales, export lots of South Australia's, you know, growing wind. Well, we're not finished yet. We're going to build more wind, I tell you, in South Australia. And we haven't even started building PV solar. 
So uh, it's quite exciting, but it's a feasibility study. Mm. And let's not sort of see it as anything more than that at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I absolutely agree. You've got to do a good job on the costs and benefits yeah. of, of the full range of options there. Um, I, I guess it's almost like part of a, a process of democratisation that we're seeing happening more broadly across society. Um, uh, and have you thought, sort of started with the sort of democratisation of the energy system? Yes. Have you started thinking about how that might feed into your just transitions ideas? Mm. Well, uh, maybe not so much in the just transition frame, but certainly we're thinking very carefully about it from a social equity perspective. Um, the solar rooftop solar revolution in Australia has been just extraordinary. When we came to government 10 years ago, there were 7,000 houses across the whole country that had rooftop solar. Just 7,000 in the whole country, and there's now 1.65 million uh, in just 10 years. We have more rooftop solar than the US with 320 million people. It's just, it's quite unique what we've done here. And batteries coming through the system is going to transform that as well. But um, Although I always take issue with the criticism usually made by right-wing media and some of the coalition that this is a sort of a champagne sipping, latte sipping. When did champagne and lattes get so <laughs> evil? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> anyway, apparently rooftop solar is all about you people who drink champagne and lattes. Um, whereas actually we know, because we have very, very detailed data on where the solar panels have been installed, and there's actually an, an inverse relationship between <coughs> penetration rates and socioeconomic status mm. of suburbs. The further you get away from a GPO, the more likely a suburb is to have high penetration rates of rooftop solar. Uh, it's, it's lower income households that are doing this for a range of reasons. But it is overwhelmingly a revolution for owner occupiers. Um, it's a revolution that's largely closed off to renters, to people in public housing, the people in congregate housing like in the big cities, uh, and we've got to fix that, um, partly because it's a wonderful thing for them uh, to do the right thing by the planet and to get significant savings on their power bills. But also, it's just going to get worse. Like mm. Their exposure to the sort of power bill increases we're seeing at the moment, their exposure to having to pay for the grid, which was gold-plated to an extraordinary degree, to tens and tens of billions of dollars that now need to be repaid by consumers. There are very serious social equity questions, I think, here <coughs> that, we're, um, that we're working with community power groups and so on about how to fix. Yeah. It's not going to be easy, um, but it's very exciting. You add electric vehicles to that, you've got a very different, very different system. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. It's really exciting. Um, one, one of the other things which I think is, is going to get worse um, are the impacts of climate change itself. So we're seeing acceleration in terms of sea level rise, um, temperatures, um, extreme events uh, having significant impacts here and overseas. Um, your book focused very strongly on emission reduction. Um, there was essentially nothing in there on climate adaptation, but they're two sides of the same coin. And, uh, uh, and arguably, Australia is one of the most um, vulnerable countries to, to climate change itself. And in fact, that impacts of climate change are the fundamental rationale for emission reductions and, uh, you know, part of this energy transition story. Um, are you likely to come out with a, a, a book um, on climate adaptation? So uh, it's perhaps climate peace might be the yeah, yeah, that's alternative? Right. Uh, we've got to get out. We've got to get to this. Mm. Um, and it's hard while we're still fighting the climate wars to talk about our adaptation. Um, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, I think, is um, our most significant piece of adaptation policy, certainly over the last 10 years or so. It's not always called that, but it's essentially that's what it is. And even that is being revisited. Before Monday night's extraordinary report on Four Corners, even that, the people are calling for, for that to be revisited, particularly the 450 yep. gig that's supposed to be returned to the river system. So it is hard to have a sensible debate about adaptation. I, I would um, drive, say, from Sydney north uh, up through Central Coast into Newcastle and so on and stop off and do different events. And uh, you, could, you could go to different areas, depending on the local council boundaries, where you had profoundly different policies about coastal development because um, the last local government elections might have been won by an Abbott group where, where the new council leadership came in and told the staff to expunge any reference from, of climate change from all of their policies. 
And then you'd go literally 20 minutes north into another local council boundary which had more progressive leadership where they had very strong climate change adaptation policies around coastal development. This is crazy. This is utterly mad. Um, so there is a role for national governments, uh, the national government, I think, to do this, not to micromanage it, but to facilitate a process that sees, uh, sees the, the very important work that needs to happen around adaptation, particularly around our coasts, mm. um, start. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the really interesting things that goes through my mind about how you have that discussion, I talk about this a bit in, in the book, um, uh, you know, what, to what extent are lawyers going to drive this? Mm. Um, you know, that's how seatbelts became mandatory in the US, through litigation. Uh, I think there will be some really interesting litigation about whether the levy at Lismore should have been higher. Uh, some of these sorts of things are going to end up in courts and we will get the, the courts pushing uh, parliaments to, to up regulation around adaptation, I think, which will be quite interesting. But I thought a really interesting contribution to the debate was an article that some people might have seen in New York magazine a few weeks ago, which has gone viral a bit. And um, one of the journalists there uh, didn't talk about impacts around the two degree mark, which tends to be where we, where we pitch our general discussion around, around impacts on you know, uh, ice melting, sea level rise, heat events, all that's so about two degrees, maybe mm. two and a bit degrees. Uh, he wrote a piece based on the upper end, mm -hmm. you know, the upper end at sort of five or six degrees. What does the world look like? What's New York like? Uh, what, and it's scared the bejesus out of me. Mm -hmm. And there's been this really interesting debate follow this article, which I encourage people to read, in The Atlantic and a whole bunch of other American public publications where climate scientists are now out debating, should we, should we be telling this story? Um, you know, this is at the upper end of the possibilities. You know, we're all assuming we start the lower end. This is at the upper end. This is not fantasy land. This is very, very serious, but this is not a fantasy. Um, and there's been this really interesting debate that I, I don't know whether you've picked yep. up on, Mark, about whether, whether scientists should be, and presumably policymakers as well, talking about this very, very serious hypothetical, you know, scenario of impacts. Um, and I think I'm watching that very closely. Yeah, I, th I think we all are. It's, yeah. a, it's a crucial part of that communication uh, challenge that we, we all have uh, in, in making this uh, a normal part of conversations rather than an exceptional part of conversations. Anyway, that um, brings us to an end of our, our um, interaction together. Now we've got um, Q&A. Um, I'd just like to say, you know, thanks, Mark, for thanks, such man. a great conversation. Thank you. <laughs> So we have some time for questions from the audience here. Um. I just have a question. Uh, the psychologist Jonathan Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind in which he described the polarised worldviews for Republicans and Democrats who lack a common language to facilitate a dialogue. So how do you get opposing parties to move out of the trenches and those political parties talk at cross purposes. You can talk about rational arguments and you're really talking to the converted in terms of your arguments here, mm. but they're opposing views on that which they don't even, those views won't even register with them. That's right. Um, well, uh, well uh, let me maybe go back to the UK experience uh, where, where uh, <clears throat> in spite of the fact that Thatcher had supported and in, in a way driven the establishment of the IPCC and, and the UN framework uh, through the 80s, um, climate had been an, an issue of division in, in, um, uh, in the 90s and, and into the, the early part of the last decade. David Cameron took the decision, you might remember when he took over the party, the Tory party, that, they, that he had to change that party's image to get rid of it, what he described as a nasty image. And so he really exercised the leadership to shift the Tory party to the centre. Labor Party, frankly, shifted a bit as well, and they were able to agree the Climate Change Act in 2008. And really, the rest very much is history. You do need leadership. Um, and, uh, and I think that's really the, the, the clean energy target debate that is, that is, whether Malcolm likes it or not, I think going to be raised in the party room over the next couple of weeks, is... Um, 
is, a, is going to be a question of leadership. I mean, Tony's trying to exercise leadership quite clearly through his insurgency here. Uh, and um, there's a very open question as to the, what sort of leadership Malcolm is going to exercise. I'm not going to be able to talk the coalition into changing their view, the coalition party room. It's got to be an internal discussion. And that's got to be a discussion that flows from their appreciation about what the rest of the community is thinking. One of the things I think has changed dramatically over the last few years, well, since we were trying to introduce our clean energy package in 2011, 2012, is the business voice. Um, you know, there were too many business organisations, frankly, that should have known better, that were out there arguing effectively that there should not be any climate change policy in Australia. Because that, that was the Abbott position and they were supporting it. Not that they had a disagreement with some of the detail of our policy, but that we should not have any policy whatsoever. Now they've shifted on that. Um, almost all of them, except maybe the Minerals Council, have shifted on that. And they need to be making that argument to the coalition. Uh, members of the, the um, voters in the electorates of um, members of the coalition need to be going to them and talking to them about what they expect of their national parliament uh, to deal with this challenge, but also to harness the opportunity. So, look, it is really hard. And I wake up some mornings and look at the newspapers and listen to the radio and I think, look, it's, it's almost hopeless to imagine uh, a position where uh, Australia had the same sort of political approach to this as the UK. And I often I harp on about the UK, but given the similarities here about our media structure, our political history, I think it is a really important example. But at the end of the day, the coalition party room is going to have to have this out. Um, because that party room essentially was, was taken over in 2009 by the Abbott view of, of, of this issue. And it's essentially been hostage to it since then. Uh, and the rest of us have been hostage to that as well. You know, I hate that sounds very partisan of me, but I just can't see a way through this without the coalition having this out. And that will require leadership of the type that David Cameron showed in the British Tory party. Yeah. Um. Um, sorry, to sort of follow on from that question. Um, you mentioned before that uh, deniers in the Australian public make up about 7%. If, the, if that sort of statistic holds up with our parliamentary representatives, surely there must be a majority of parliamentarians who believe that we should be acting on climate change and can we break across party lines and get some consensus within the parliament? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the important thing about that data that CSIRO comes out with is it is only 7% that don't, don't think climate change is happening. Uh, but of the 75% or 80% or whatever it is that think climate change is happening, there's still a very substantial share of that. I can't remember the latest data, but around 40% of people in Australia still think that climate change is happening, but it's not a result of human activity. So it's that, that's not, that, that group is not the only challenge that we have. There's still a substantial body of opinion. It's declining quite, quite quickly, as it is in the US, but it is still a, a substantial body of opinion that, yes, it, yes something's happening, but it's not us. Um, the, 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 um, there is a clear majority in the parliament. I mean, everyone in our party, everyone in the Greens party, uh, you know, we want climate action. I mean, the, the, the small groups in the Labor Party over the last 10 or 20 years that, that were a bit sceptical about all this, then they've moved on. Uh, this is a consensus position in Labor. It's obviously very much a consensus position in the Greens. And there's a strong body of opinion in the Liberal Party, at least, that um, this is real and something we should be coming to grips with. But that party room is, is just captured mm. by the group that doesn't want action. And that's why I say, you know, we're not going to pull Liberals away from the party room to work with us across the aisle. It's not like the US in that sense. They're going to have to have this out within their party room. Christian. Uh, Christian Downey from the ANU. I just wanted to ask a question about, I guess, how do you win the battle and how do you win the war? You spoke about framing. I think it's important to frame this around tangible things that people get. But another strategy, obviously, which you've spoken about is coalition building. I just wanted to ask, what, what's the kind of lesson you learnt from last time in government about where the key coalitions need to be built that are enough to win, I guess? Uh, well, uh, well, I think the, the, the critical, the, the swing factor is business. 
I think, and you're not going to get the whole business community because substantial parts of the Australian business community are deeply threatened by the de decarbonisation agenda. You, you know, we know who they are. Uh, but, but those groups that, that were very negative campaigned against us, um, campaigned against there being any climate change policy, have shifted and they are an important part of the coalition, particularly uh, not the coalition as in the Liberal Party coalition, the sort of coalition you're talking about, particularly when I cannot see um, a time in the foreseeable future where we do not have a concerted opposition from Australia's mainstream media. So we've got to work around the fact that um, the, the mainstream media is going to continue to campaign against that. Like the government's muddled attempt to introduce mandatory emission standards in cars, with the last developed economy not to have them, uh, two weeks ago, just gives you an example about that. It should be low-hanging fruit. If they'd done it, we would have come out and said, we support you fully. Um, you know, there, there are savings to consumers over the life of a vehicle that runs thousands of dollars. So there's low-hanging fruit and they messed it up and then the Daily Telegraph ran, you know, a, a sort of a crusade against them for carbon taxes on cars. So you've got to keep business, uh, I think, focused on, uh, on policy that is stable and enduring. That's what they want. But I think they've shifted over the last several years. They understand, first of all, there's no getting around this. I think after Copenhagen and, frankly, even a bit after Abbott got elected and the renewable energy target was in the mix, I think some of them thought, well, maybe we'll duck this. Maybe we'll get. Maybe this has all just been a phase, uh, and we'll get back to how things used to be. Well, that's gone. They recognise. They understand now. They're being told by their global headquarters for those that are multinationals, this is the future. Get with it and find opportunities to invest. So probably they're the critical group. I think. Mm. Up the back. Um, I've noticed that there's a bit of a debate over whether the two degree Paris goal is actually achievable and I was wondering in light of the fear that came about when America withdrew from the Paris Agreement, if we don't meet the two degree goal, how do you think that will affect attitudes towards climate policy in the future? I think it's important, I talk about, um, I talk about this a little bit in the book, how we came up with the two degree threshold and, and um, maybe somewhere in this room. but. Climate scientists were, were um, nervous about adopting a threshold. As a policymaker, I like thresholds. I like clarity. I like something that we sort of structure policy around. Um, uh, but we need to be clear that this is not a black and white issue. That, that you know, if we, if we manage to hold below two degrees, everything's fine. And if we don't, well, we tried. No use crying over spilt milk. Like, this is a, this is, these are shades of grey. And um, even if we can't hold to two, which I think is going to be incredibly challenging. Uh, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but on all of the advice I get, all the stuff I read, holding to two is going to be very, very challenging. It requires huge um, shifts over the course of the 2020s and then, you know, really strong decarbonisation right through the 2030s. And um, with the odd exception, that's hard to see that sort of willpower happening. Uh, so, um, you know, I, we can't see things fall apart just because some people are going to come out and say, look, it's going to be really hard to hold to two. Mm. We've, we've got to keep that commitment to try and hold to the Paris commitments. We don't quite know what well below two degrees means yet in a carbon budget sense. The IPCC will be um, publishing its carbon budget for the new frame under Paris next year, I think, in 2018, and we'll have to, you know, if we were in government, we'd then get the Climate Change Authority to try and calibrate that for an Australian carbon budget. That's all going to be new. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that because, because uh, you know, there, there is going to be increasing discussion about how achievable two degrees is and quite what we have to do to get there. That's going to be an incredibly difficult discussion. It should never, though, um, uh, become a question that, that bears on whether or not we take strong climate action. Indeed. I, I, I love the carbon budget approach. Sorry, yeah. I love the carbon budget approach. I don't know why we weren't doing this 10 or 15 years ago. Mm. Uh, it's an, obviously hard, but two degrees is sort of easy to talk about, but it's hard then to calibrate, calibrate transport policy around that or energy policy. If you've got a carbon budget, which is how the UK works, then, then you can actually sort of 
structure policy. And I think uh, over the next couple of years, trying to work out what the carbon budget for the Paris Agreement is and then how you distribute that fairly across countries is going to be very important. Yeah, that's right. And, and just to reinforce the, um, the need for rapid response is that there was a study which came out just a few weeks ago uh, from uh, some researchers in Melbourne which indicate depending on the state of the Pacific, we could actually reach 1.5 degrees uh, by 2026. Um, and so, so the, the time for moving on this is actually extraordinarily short. And, and that's why I think the consensus is the chance of reaching 1.5 is, is essentially disappeared yeah. um, and the chances of staying below 2 are, are starting to shrink really oh, quickly. Sure. Just to give you a sense about where we're going at the moment, um, the UK, so if you used 2005 as the baseline, which is the baseline we use, um, the UK will, has already reduced its carbon pollution by 30% since 2005, and will, its carbon budget for 2030 is for a 61% reduction of 2005 levels. So the data, the projections that Turnbull, the Turnbull government released just before Christmas project that by 2030 on current policy settings, Australia's reduction between 2005 and 2030 will be zero. Be zero. Well, okay, um, we've only got time for one more question. Yeah. Are you, okay, as long as we're going to go over seven then. Um, so there's one here. I just, a very quick one. Um, to Queenslanders with the high unemployment in the north especially, the offer of a million, um, sorry, a billion dollars to Adani would seem to be attractive. Has the Labor Party thought of uh, saying, OK, if you elect us, we'll make a concessional loan to the Queensland government for renewable energy of a billion dollars? I mean, they can't argue about where the money's going to come from and that sort of thing. Yeah, well... Um... <sighs> Yeah, you know, interestingly, I was talking to someone who did it around through the central Queensland coal fields uh, over the last couple of weeks yesterday, and they said, the coal workers up there just say, stop talking to us about Adani. But we don't think it's going to happen. The jobs will be minimal, um, uh, because we know the jobs are not going to be the sort of job numbers that they trumpet. I don't think the thing will get off the ground anyway. But, but, but I think uh, what you point to, I think, is the need for an alternative jobs narrative for, for central and north Queensland, because they really are suffering. I mean, they've lost a lot of jobs up there over the last few years. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think renewable energy needs concessional loans uh, in Queensland. I think they're ready to deploy um, right now without concessional loans. What we took to the last election is um, that the North, Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, which is the fund that Canavan uh, wants to use to finance the Adani railway line and a new coal-fired power station in Townsville, we said that we'd, we'd um, hypothecate a billion dollars of that for tourism infrastructure. And there are a whole range of other things. So Albo and Tony Burke and I were up in North Queensland a couple of weeks ago trying to sort of talk about these sorts of things other than just talking about coal. And there are all sorts of businesses, um, local ab remote Aboriginal communities that have tourism opportunities. They can't get credit from banks, but they need to do things like build some roads or build some decking through some, uh, through some wetlands to do walking tours and things. This sort of facility would change their operations. But the government's not focused on that. The government's focused on throwing a billion dollars at Adani or this crazy idea of building a new coal-fired power station. I mean, when, when Malcolm came out with this idea in January, no one had talked about new coal for years. When he came out with this idea in January and said, I'm interested in private sector partners to build a new coal-fired power station, there was deafening silence. Deafening silence until Clive Palmer said, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, you know, when I've finished building Titanic 2, I'll do it. Um, so, so I think you, you raise a really important broader point, which is uh, what the Adani thing raises, I think, from a Queensland political perspective, is the need to talk about alternative jobs opportunities. And, and there are plenty out there. Mm. Yeah. 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 Just one last question. Hi. You mentioned, uh, Mark, the views of the coal workers in <laughs> Queensland. <laughs> I'd be interested in your, um, your understanding of the sort of broader views of the, of the union movement and how, you know, what they're, if they part of this coalition, do they speak up very much on the issue? Uh, on Adani or...? No, no, climate? sorry, on the broader issue of yeah. climate change and climate policy. Yeah. Um, so the Mining and Energy Division of the CFMEU, which used to be its own union, the Mine Workers Union, uh, 
uh, has coverage of the coal mining and coal-fired power sector up the eastern seaboard. It has been going to the climate conferences since, um, essentially since they started. Uh, they are deeply engaged in this debate. And when you go and talk at their work, or when I go and talk at their workplaces or delegates meetings, uh, they know far more than anyone else in the community what is happening in their industry. Uh, they know it, they're living it. Uh, and um, their focus is on just transition. Uh, it was unions like that, along with NGO groups, that really drove that provision in the Paris Agreement. Sharon Burrow, you might remember, was the head of the ACTU, now runs the global union movement, was the key advocate, the key face of that campaign in, in Paris, um, because uh, they, they understand the realities of what is happening. And I think particularly that, that union, the Mine Workers Union, or the Mining and Energy Division of the CFMEU, Tony Ma, their national secretary, uh, has been one of the most thoughtful and courageous advocates about what is happening in climate change in Australia for two decades. Uh, he was a, a strong partner for Greg Combe in the development of the clean energy framework. Now, obviously, that had some stuff in there about how the power sector, the coal-fired um, part of the power sector, was treated in a transitional sense. But this is not a union that's pulling its cardigan over its head and pretending that everything's going to be rosy. This is a union that's deeply engaged in the realities of what is happening and have been for 25 years. So, um, you know, I think what we owe to them, to their members and to their delegates, particularly as a Labor Party, frankly, is to take the challenge of just, just transition very, very seriously. Great point to end on. Sharon. So my job is really just to, to thank uh, both of you. Really, I think what we've heard is a very, very thoughtful exploration of incredibly challenging, very contested issues. Uh, Mark, it's very hard when you've got two Marks. You know. <laughs> um, but Mark Butler uh, really is giving us, uh, I think, a call to action to come be part of this wide coalition with a small c uh, of concerned citizens. I'm sure there are enlightened business people in the room as well. Uh, and of course, uh, within the, the NGO sector to really come and get together to, to help shift this agenda going forward. I also heard that actually data is power. You spoke about uh, the importance of data. It's such a powerful tool for the researchers in the room. Uh, we've got to make sure we have the sorts of data that enable these types of actions and feed it constantly into our politicians uh, and policy makers. I was very upset that we didn't speak about the food system, because the food system is one of the biggest contributors to climate change as well, uh, and is also one of the systems where we can actually do something about it. Maybe that'll be another book. You've got an awful lot of books to write, Mark, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure, you know, why not, why not? Uh, but really, please, uh, a, a time for hope, I think. Uh, we have, I think, a courageous leadership, uh, as we've just heard from Mark. I'm delighted to be part of a university that takes this really seriously and really pleased to work with my colleague Mark Howden uh, with Climate Change Institute, you know, as I said, across the university. Come and be part of Regnet as well. This, of course, is my wee plug for our school, <laughs> uh, the School of Regulation and Global Governance. We think about exactly these sorts of issues of how we, how you know, regulation and ways, different forms of governance to move these sorts of issues forward. Uh, but really, thank you. Thank you very much. I think very hopeful uh, ideas, uh, ways forward. Mark, I'm sure, will be outside for a wee while. Happy to uh, sign the books. Uh, so please, thank you very much for coming out tonight.